do that. I might resonate with you. Please do. There are some really good ones. Uh, I won't read them all out. Well, I posted some in the chat. We'll collect them all and just share them if people are interested. But hopefully, you had a good chat with the person. Hopefully, you resonated with the idea. Um, so, thanks everyone for doing that. Um, and now, on with the yeah. agenda. So, we're going to move up. Kat, if you want to come up, um, move on to our first presentation. Is it okay to record? Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. So, over to you. No, I've left it. Oh, I haven't shared. Share. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just going to keep it. Hiya. Um, so I'm Kat. I'm one of the faculty learning technologists for the Faculty of Engineering at UCL, so home based here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, my portfolio or Mahara. Um, has anyone here used my portfolio before? Just out of curiosity, fair few hands. Um, so for the past 12 months, um, I've been. I will stop saying. I'm um, sorry. Uh, I've been learning how to use it. So before 12 months ago, I'd never used my portfolio before. We were using it because the brand new engineering foundation year, which launched in September this academic year, last year, um, it was being used as their main assessment piece. So at, throughout the whole year, the uh, foundation year students would gather their portfolio, put it all together, and then they'd submit it through my portfolio. But what we found is none of us had actually used it before. So the module leads, the program leads, they hadn't actually used this assessment tool. So we were sort of like, great, we're brand new program, brand new students and we've not used this tool before. So I spent the past 12 months learning how to use it. And what I really wanted to do was get involved with the foundation year. It was a widening participation program. So it's students who generally probably wouldn't have gotten into UCL. Um, so I won't read through this or I can do. That might be more fun than me just saying um, for the next half hour. Um, I'll stop eventually. But basically, to get into UCL, students needed the equivalent of about 144 youth cast points, which for a foundation year programme, wine and participation, they're not really going to have. They're going to be more of an A-level CD background. So we really wanted to support the students into joining the foundation year. And then the next 12 months are spent building up the skills that they would need to actually join a full UCL programme. So we didn't want to just kind of get them through the doors and just leave them to kind of not a struggle, but feel a bit unsupported. So we took a really more proactive, hopefully proactive approach in it. So my portfolio throughout the year, I kind of realized it's not actually as scary as I thought it was. The first time I used it, I was like, what is this? Aesthetically, it is when you first log on and it is just the my portfolio and then users create blah, blah, blah. It is a bit daunting because you're sort of like, where do I start? The more I got to use it, the more I sort of you saw other ones, I realized it is quite creative. More creative than me just putting text on here. This probably isn't the most creative use of a portfolio. So in February, January, we ran a face-to-face -face session with the foundation year students, and that was to basically get bums on seats so we know that they spent time using it because we can say to students, Practice using this. This is what you're going to. This is what your assessment will be on. We strongly recommend not using it five minutes before your submission. But I kind of feel like we all know we're students. Guilty of it myself as a student. They're doing things a lot of the time last minute. So we had a timetable session built into it when they would be on campus uh, in teaching, so we could kind of show them how to use it. So the session ran for an hour, and it was just me showing them how to build a portfolio which I've got here somewhere. Sorry, I do have it here somewhere. There we go. So before the students actually came to the session, we sent them this. And it was, it was literally just an example to show what they could make. So to kind of try and make them relax, it's why I did a Final Fantasy presentation, just so they're not as daunting. Hopefully, they'd find it a bit more relaxed and chilled. Um, and also because I'm an absolute nerd and I do love Final Fantasy. Um, so I put as much content as I could think. We've got a world map. We've got a video of um, Coca-Cola with the game. Just kind of showing it's a lot of fun stuff. During the session, I did actually say to them, make sure you don't do what I did and take a video off YouTube. You have to own the content. 
So if anyone here works with Square Enix, that's not there. Yeah. Uh, and neither is that Moogle. So after showing them how to build a portfolio, we then got them to spend half an hour just doing it themselves. And what we originally covered was just the very basics of this is how you add a block, this is how you add an image and text. And I said to them, don't go into the two depth stuff of skins, backgrounds. We can do that on one to one sessions or we can do it another time for now. Just focus on the very basics. And of course, we had a handful of students who were like, how do I do skins and things? They, they took to my portfolio so quickly, they then went into the more advanced stuff that I wasn't quite prepared for. Um, so when the session started, we said we got them to fill out a, a, men, a men, Mentimeter um, and we said to them, how confident are they? And you can sort of see love, most of them were not confident at all. Only two people said they were extremely confident. We then asked the same question, ex exactly the same question afterwards. And it was really nice to see that no one answered not confident at all at least half of them were now somewhat well more than half were somewhat confident so it was really nice to see in that space of a 40 minute hour session that they felt they had improved it and they weren't um, as as scared as they might have been because what we didn't want was them to get to the end of the year get to their portfolio and think oh god i don't know what i'm doing because that's just going to be a bit of an overload especially when you've gotten through the whole year to kind of just panic at that last hurdle um, so the challenges we got at this point um, was learning the tool ourselves. Um, we had, I actually do need to update this. So we had eight drop-in sessions and seven out of eight had a zero attendance. The only one that had people attend was the day before the submission okay. where they were all like, how do I add a video? The file submission doesn't work. And there was a couple of questions we were like, that really should go to your module lead. Um, so the thing that we predicted was getting students in the very last session before the deadline. We try to, to preempt that, we try to go around it, but we can't force the students to join. So unfortunately, we just kind of did our best to answer those questions. But unfortunately, they were the ones where if you told us a week ago, we could have been a bit more, had more of an answer prepared. Um, the feedback was really positive. Um, it was really nice for me. It was the first time I sort of led a student session. So to get a 4.7 out of 5 rating was really, really nice. And for 100% to say it met their expectations, however, they could have just had low expectations. Um, what we did ask them is because we'd like to repeat this in the future was what they would have liked to have seen. So example of a report submitted, that would have been difficult for us because, again, this was the very first it's the first time we ran this session, but it's also the first time the foundation year itself was run. So we didn't really have things like that. Um, we know that they enjoyed the interactive um, session. They found this uh, helpful and clear and engaging, um, which is good when I keep saying um. um. What students didn't like, teaching was a fast pace, which I'm trying really hard not to do now, which is probably why I'm saying um a lot. Um, and not, I feel like we should just have those snowballs and just throw them at me every time and that there wasn't enough focus on the application of reports. So this was an intentional part on, on me because I'm not an engineer by trade, by nature. I'm very much, I'm more of a humanities background. So I kind of stayed away from getting into the, the nitty gritty of engineering because I don't have a clue what I'm talking about then. So I tried to kind of keep it simple for me. So hopefully the students would understand what I was saying because if I try and regurgitate some engineering uh, terms, I'm not going to have a clue what I'm talking about. I'm pretty sure they then wouldn't understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, so this is a portfolio I've kind of been working on throughout the year. It does need updating because now the, the foundation year has has completed its first, first academic year. So this was the timeline we worked towards. Don't know if I can actually make that any clearer. Nope, I won't download things onto the computer. <laughs> So I'm now going to get really close and try and read things. Um, so we had discussions around January, February and May. It was exploring uh, how, I'm so glad it's not just my eyesight and it is just a really bad image. I'm really sorry about that. Um, and undertaking training. So all through January up until October, December, it was a lot of focus on learning my portfolio. And then in January, February, it was kind of, putting that forward to the students. So the next steps, uh, it's going to be an ongoing project for us, hopefully. 
Um, so now that the students have finished, I'm going to meet with the foundation year team next week, I think. And we're going to talk about my portfolio and I'm going to ask them, have they got examples of students' work that they'd be happy for us to sort of share with the ongoing cohorts? And also, are those students happy for us to share their work as well? And we're going to focus on the reports. Um, so more examples that are relevant to the students. So I can still show them the, the lovely Final Fantasy portfolio, but we can also give them an idea of what they should be submitting and hopefully give, give a bit more detail. While this was going on, we were creating guidance at the same time. So, and this one I'll segue into my next part, hopefully. Um, so because the admin team hadn't used my portfolio before, it was teaching students, but it was also teaching admin and academics. So as I was learning, I was creating these. Um, and originally it was using the Moodle book activity. And then I was like, why am I doing it on that when I could literally use it on my portfolio? And then it's another example of, of how it can look. So again, this is still a work in progress. It, it grows as we sort of learn more, as we grow. Um, it's got videos which aren't loading, which is a really great, great way to find out your portfolio is not working. Um, And then one thing that this has led on to, if I can scroll up, is a project that the lovely Irina contacted me about and Fiona. Um, so we're going to be working on actually doing a new guidance for my portfolio for UCL, trying to make it as wide as possible. So we all know in different faculties, everyone works differently. I'm in engineering now, but I was in population health sciences before. Both faculties work so differently, and I can imagine across arts and humanities as well. So what we want to do is get as many people involved and try and make guidance that works for everyone. It's not just kind of, it applies only to engineering, it applies to anyone across UCL, hopefully. So what we've um, started doing is running focus groups. So this is the first step. Um, originally, we planned to run three focus groups with the first, um, First was scheduled to run on Tuesday. We unfortunately had to cancel it. Um, so it was already off to a great start. The second was yesterday and that one went really, really well. It actually ran over time a little bit because we were having really good discussions. And what we've kind of discussed about is um, running some more across the academic year. This is probably, it's difficult to find times that work for people because obviously the summer people are doing board of examiners, summer assessments. They're also going on leave. Then when we go into September, we've got some of the postgraduates wrapping up, but the new academic year starting October, you've got the start of term. So I kind of feel like everyone knows we there's no perfect timing. So I think we're just going to keep running them every so often. And then, Irina, I don't know if you want to join and say anything. I've been doing great uh, working with Kat and Fiona, Harvey is online, um, and that we're really trying to um, have a community-led approach to the training and the design and because there's so many ways in which you could use my portfolio we really want to start um, making those distinctions clearer so that um, when people think about using my portfolio they, they have let's say even a bit of a decision tree sort of activity so we're really hoping to put some more of the learning design aspects uh, at the start of the whole training and upskilling process so yeah, watch this space. Yeah. It's hopefully going to be, words have now just gone, what Irina said basically. I had, some, I had something to add and it's now just gone. So yeah. Um, any questions? Yes. What happens with the portfolio when the students actually graduate and leave the university? So they can download their portfolios? So, you can export a portfolio, but it, it looks, the few times I've tried it, it looks a mess. But what we can do is they can, I'd have to log on, I forgot my password. You can um, share it as a secret URL. So what I've done to share it with Geraldine, this was as a secret URL, it was set to public and you just have to change the settings in the date. So I think I've set this to the end of the year. Um, I don't know what happens to students' accounts because I know with Moodle they've got access for seven years um, to a Moodle page, so they can keep going back to that. 
with my portfolio, I don't know if there's a, a deadline for it. I don't know if once they go from a UCL to a UCL alumni email address, if that then transfers and keeps their account. Um, that is something we do need to look into. Uh, there was a question in the chat. Uh, so Leo, Leo is very happy. Um, uh, great series of my portfolio embedded in other ways as well as an assignment so students can get more familiar with it. I was wondering, is it being used in one module or more widely across this program? I would love to be able to talk about this as an example of what you can do. Um, so it was really nice. We had last year we had another model using UCL Reflect as like a blogging tool and they asked to use it again this year and they'd used my portfolio previously but they found it was quite clunky it wasn't very supported this was quite a few years ago so when they asked to set up the UCL Reflect blogs this year we said oh we've actually started using my portfolio is it something you'd be interested in and they asked could we do the session that we ran for the foundation year students with their students so we are finding across UCL more and more people are starting to use it, which is quite nice. Um, and people who've used it before given up on it because they just didn't like how it worked and have come back to it, have sort of said it, it's changed quite a lot and it has changed for the better. Hi. So have you seen that Mahara going through a bit of um, it's had a UX designer look at the how Mahara works and looks and then completely that's it. You're only in your very initial stages. Yeah. Have you seen that? I've not, but I think Irina has. They're going to make it a lot more. It's going to be like you were more contemporary, less Windows. Exactly. You were describing how when you first see it, it's going to be like, oh, and like very, yeah, it's a while to get your head around, whereas I think it's going to move in a better direction soon. And it, it is really nice seeing, like, I've seen student works. Um, one of the people we had the focus group yesterday was sharing student portfolios, and they were amazing. I was looking at that being like, yeah, maybe I should up my game a little bit. Um, but they can do really, really nice things with it. So yeah, it'd be really interesting to see with the UX how it how it improves because from someone who came into it last year, I've kind of found it easy to take to, but then when you find the little flaws in it, they're only little flaws, but they're still kind of really limiting. It's like, oh, so yeah. Cool. Hey. Um, I was just wondering, if it sounds like you did a bit of stuff at the beginning and then they present the portfolio at the end. So do you do any work on the portfolio kind of throughout the year where they were kind of adding to it? And this is what we encourage them to do from January. So we had the session with them in January and we said, start learning how to use it now, start adding things to it. Unfortunately, by the time the submission point came to, um, I saw a couple of them and they had just added Word documents to it. So some students went really creative with it some students went quite minimal with it i think what we're going to do is one of the things we've learned and now that i'm more confident in using it myself um we're going to do the teaching session hopefully earlier on in in term one not in the middle of term two and we're sort of going to make the students realize like we are here as a point of call please do use us because traditionally my role is staff based but i would i've previously worked in student student-based roles and I kind of miss that interaction so I think it's it's a really nice part of my job that I had previously so now we're going to try and sneak it back in there to be like you know we are here to help you and we definitely want you to succeed so okay. yeah so it wasn't was it being used at all as a to, to provide some formative feedback during that that time which is what one of the main reasons that we kind of try and promote I don't I think, think so. the academics work because, again, they themselves weren't that familiar with it. So we were sort of trying to teach them how to mark with it. And I think what we ended up doing was um, marking through Moodle because the marking bit on my portfolio, it just it didn't look that nice. It was pass or fail, which if you hope I don't hopefully students didn't fail. But imagine to log on and just see the words fail is pretty disheartening. I mean, it's not nice to log on and see 49. But it's still, at least with the number, you can kind of judge where you are. So they didn't do formative marking on it. I think, again, we might look into doing that with them next year, because if we do formative marking on my portfolio, it might encourage the students to to use it more throughout the year and hopefully get them a bit more even creative. Not graded, but just with the feedback, even peer feedback, uh, just a, a checkpoint. Really yeah, sort of I don't think they did peer fee feedback. Um, I think because it was the first year it ran, it was being they were sort of a bit not hesitant but 
kept it more to to the the module leads and also I know with peer feedback sometimes you don't always get students engaging and for a foundation year I don't know how discouraging you might feel if, if you're sort of trying to do this and you're putting a lot more into it I mean it's not nice when you're on a, a full undergrad or a postgrad program and you're not getting the, the peer feedback so we didn't do peer feedback and I think formative they still I know one of the modules did see it throughout the year but not on my portfolio they'd submit like a poster or a um not an essay but like a little word document through moodle and that's how they got their formative feedback hey and i'm not thinking what made them move away from like how do you say before there's other needs or like did they say the things are approached with or um what goes with that decision sorry say that again uh, what made the faculty move away from using reflect for the portfolios and how do you say mahara was different or what goes with that decision so I've only been with the faculty for 18 months, so I don't know how it was before I joined when they used it. I think uh, modules that were using it and then moved over to Reflect, it was because they just weren't getting on with um, my portfolio. One of the reasons I sort of said, hey, come back to portfolio over Reflect was because for us to set it up, we had to have we had to fill in a spreadsheet and we had to send it off to another department and they generated the blogs for us. I was like, this way, my portfolio, the student can register themselves, they can have as many, like they can create as many blogs as they want. They're not limited by us relying on another team. And it, it felt like it just took a bit of pressure off having that bit of control back as well. So that was the main reason I said to them was come back to, to my portfolio is we're learning how to use it, but also you, you can skip out this whole step of putting students into groups and sending it off. So for the staff and then for the teachers, when they actually mark the portfolio, grade the portfolio, did they find it difficult or not? So presumably they used the marking scheme, and presumably they were searching for specific parts of the portfolio, what the students initially instructed to do. So I just imagine because it's so different, each portfolio looks so different, maybe just time consuming. Marking, I didn't get involved with. Um, but I think I don't think they marked it on my portfolio. What they did is they got students to submit a link through Moodle because the Moodle my portfolio integration tool got released as we were doing this. So we said to students, we we kind of ignored that for now because we were like we're not quite sure how it works. So we won't let's not confuse the students even more and learn something else as well. Um, so we set up a Moodle assignment activity and they submitted just the L and. They got their mark through Moodle. Um, none of the marking went through my portfolio. Hey. Um, it's sort of problem, um, and I remember the same problem from a decade ago of students doing the work at the last minute. Um, the students doing the work at the last minute, coming to support, uh, you know, to help them there, um, on the last day. Have you? Discussed with the uh, academics or policy about separating the assignment into smaller chunks. Not yet. So we've not actually had a follow up with the the foundation year team because when they it kind of got to a point where it was a, a busy period for everyone. So I think the last submission was earlier in Ju I think it was a couple of weeks ago in July. So I think they've now had all of the submissions. So we've got a meeting with the foundation year team next week to sort of see how everything went. So the original portfolio that I showed, where is it? Uh, the first page, this is still ongoing. So the follow ups are going to be taking place from next week onwards where we've got people who are more more available to kind of sit down and really discuss what went right, what went wrong, and what can we do this year. The main things we've talked about um, are just holding the session a bit earlier and trying to get it built into the timetable. So um, yeah, the team, that, that's the main thing we've been focusing on is let's hold it in sort of October, November and find time there. We've not actually done any of the other discussion points yet, but next week, and then I can update my portfolio. <laughs> Awesome. I will be now. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. Um, next up, we have Sarah Sherman. Oh, yeah. 
Okay. Gosh, it's been a long time since I've presented in a, an in-person M25. So it's lovely to see so many people, many familiar, many new um, in these wonderful settings. So hello, everyone. My name's Sarah. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the Bloomsbury Learning Exchange. It's a cross-institutional consortium. We have six partner institutions. Many of you belong to some of those institutions. And we've been going for 20 years, as you can see from the logo. So my role is to find out what's happening, particularly my partners, but beyond is also useful, um, and to sort of uh, share, do the knowledge exchange bit, which is the E of BLEE, um, we have some joint training, some joint resources, we have special interest groups, all sorts of things that bring our community together, academics, library, staff development, IT, the whole caboodle, anything related to digital education. So um, my presentation today, it's been a long time since I presented at uh, an M25, let alone attended one in person. Um, but it's all around social media. Do you remember that thing we used to use quite a lot? So um, I want to... Um, show you first a timeline a timeline of sorts it's my timeline from the last sort of 15 16 months maybe a bit longer um so let's go back to the 28th of october 2022 um that was when musk's acquisition of twitter completed so it'd been ticking along for like a year we were kind of talking about it what will it mean but the final twitter became x i guess in uh end of october 22. a month later chat GPT came online. So I guess November 2022, again, we were starting to think about this AI thing, but nothing had happened until this date when a thing exists that's sort of free and, and available for anyone to use. The following month, I had a child. So I was then gone. And my life was kind of like this for <laughs> about 30 months. That is not my child, but it's pretty good uh, description of her. So I was gone. And quite a lot happened in that 13 months. So I returned on the 1st of Feb to an academic world that had turned on its head. I generated that picture myself on um, uh, using some AI. So I was quite proud of that. So also I felt really lost in many, in many reasons. I felt like this AI thing, Geno AI had taken over everyone's uh, conversations. There were conference, conferences about it, conference papers, papers, articles, everything this was not supposed to be a presentation about ai but you can see how like oh my god this is it's hard enough returning to work anyway um after having a kid but but this was like something else so my immediate thought is i'll get on social media and i'll find out like what's going on so my toolbox up until i came back to work was whatsapp and signal i've got some friends who won't use whatsapp but they're quite happy using signal um so i was straight on whatsapp to julie kind of had to duck out but i'm like people still using Twitter like like what's happening um Facebook Instagram I use quite a lot and this is this is my toolbox for work related stuff as well as personal we're talking work because we're all supposed to be working today um Twitter was my main source of use of social media and a bit of LinkedIn because we were all like supposed to have a LinkedIn profile so I kind of had one it was a bit like ropey but it, it was there and I was like okay tick I've got one um so what did I used to use social media for in a work related context? You don't need to know about like boring pictures I put of my kids. I don't actually, I don't do that. Um, what did I use it for? I used it for promotion. So if we were doing, uh, uh, if we had a resource, we have a few MOOCs that we've developed. So I would use Twitter mainly to promote the MOOC. Hey, our MOOC has gone live and, and launched and ret please retweet and all of this stuff. Uh, crowdsourcing, the use of Twitter polls. I did once use a Twitter poll to help me decide um, what colour fence I should paint my garden, but I did use to use it in a work related context as well. It's useful. Um, but also, I remember we used a lot of polls in some of our MOOCs. So we've got a MOOC on um, using technology to support teaching and learning. Um, and one of the activities is a poll. So it's like, here's Twitter, you can use it in your teaching and try out using a poll. Um, I used it for making announcements. Um, 
we are doing this event, it's open to everyone, or we've got this um, nice group or whatever it is, announcements, sharing stuff, advertising, jobs. Some of you are working with me and that's good and I might have advertised it through social media. So that was kind of what I was doing. Um, so that's what I was doing. I'm just wondering now, we're going to do some analog polling, which means put your hand up. And if you're listening to me or watching me online, if you could raise your hands, I think there's a hand raise um, icon, icon in Collaborate. Um, who is still using what was Twitter is now X? I don't know if anyone else, anyone calls it X. Put your hands up really, really nice and wide. We're recording this session. I'm going to some analog note that sounds like someone's raised their hand. So, Mm -hmm. It's all to do with work. Okay. It's not it's not like the whole room, right? Would you say it's about a third? <laughs> you reluctantly, but if you use it for work, put your hand up. Doesn't matter if you don't really want to or if you have if it's been used. Okay, that still hasn't really helped as much. It's still I reckon about a third. Okay. Um all right. How about um, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So who was using it with me before the world went crazy? That's a really good point. Thank you, a dude. A few more going online. Okay. I'd say that's a good majority, right? And so we had about a third. So I'm going to go majority. I'm just making some notes. Uh, this is being recorded. I will listen to it again. Okay. How about blue skies? That's the little blue butterfly, right? Anyone using that? Before the pandemic, but not before, before the world went crazy, before I went on my yeah. one. Pardon? Was it? Okay, all right. Who's using it now? Dom is because he needed it. Uh, for, work? for work, for work. Even if it's a little bit for work, but you're still using it for work. One, two, three, four, <laughs> about five. I don't know how many people are in here, but we can work that out later. So, Blue Sky is about five. This is online, this is in person people. I'll check online later. Um, Masterdon, that did exist beforehand because I remember people saying, oh, we could use Masterdon instead of. Who was using it before? Who has an account with Masterdon before? 20 around 2022 no one okay and who's yeah you did okay we have one let's, let's, let's say that's one that's cool uh who has now been using it Marston. so we go from one again in person i'll check on my nato one two three four five ish again okay interesting um and threads any i don't think threads existed in 2022 so let's get that who's using threads now for work alex <laughs> oh, it's not for work. The uh, cats. I, cats, you need the, the cats thing to, to relieve yourself of stress of work. Uh, okay, how about were you using LinkedIn beforehand? I mean, we all, yeah, pretty much the majority. Reluctant hands going up. So I would say. Well, that's true. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Um, and now, has that changed? So someone didn't put their hands up before and is now putting it up? I think there's more now. So majority and then like everyone-ish. This is really scientific. I won't be writing up an academic paper about this. Okay, uh, so how about some other things? Slack, who was using that before? A lot of people were using Slack at work, I know. Yeah, work. <laughs> Okay, so that's maybe like again a third. And how about now? So that's even less. That's interesting. So from a third to fewer. Uh, Discord. A bit of Discord before. This is the before. Yeah, and after. So that's again that's less than a third, and then fewer. Uh, yeah, and uh, Teams. Who was using Teams in 2020? I think we probably all were in 2022 because yeah. it existed. So it's pretty much the majority, then the vast majority, I would say. So let's do two vast. Okay, all right. Have I over to you? So I've done enough of the hands up. That's hopefully like waking you up a bit. Um, what else are you using? What have I missed out in terms of like thinking about social media -y things? Have I missed anything? Instagram. Yeah. Okay, so maybe the, the the things that were in my toolbox, and I was, but use anyone using Instagram for work? Okay. 
<laughs> uh, what are you using it for? Sharing stuff. Um, some of the, quite a few, I work with quite visual people, so they're, they're just putting that stuff out there and commenting on that and Okay. All right, so that's Chris. Yes, you've got your hand up as well. So we actually have some student ambassadors for members. Oh. They um, have run, uh, like run on student reduction, and they hand it something from one of the other companies that doesn't have a student program to yeah, promote the technology you had to make students feel more comfortable when they're involved with that. So, yeah. Awesome. Is that what you do? Uh -huh. Okay. So, but we just said that was just Instagram, but then so you took about LinkedIn for student union. Um, yeah, Chris. Is anyone, is anyone using Beaver Engage? Oh, so the, old, <laughs> the old Yammer. Oh, the old Yammer. Beaver yeah, Engage. Yeah, yeah. Previously, previously known as Yammer. I think it's a no. Yeah, no, <laughs> Yammer was like one of the first sort of like networking you know, buzzing things. So that Facebook kind of for work. Facebook for work. Yeah, for yeah, work. for work, for work. Um, okay, so what out of the like the what is available? Oh, sorry, yeah, Substack. Oh yeah, no, I've heard about that. People like get people to buy them copies and stuff on that. Anyone using Substack? I think there's a monetization thing in it, and yeah, if you post on it a lot, and say you might have got good content for me, but buy me a coffee, and then you know, as a way of thank you. I find Substack is like a post medium platform. Okay. You use it for it's centered around newsletters, but it, it's learned from medium in the interface design. To promote her blogs. Blogger, WordPress, Medium, Substack, yeah. adding a feature. Okay. Uh, nobody's mentioned TikTok yet either. No, gosh, God, who's using TikTok for work? <laughs> that would be interesting. Some do, not me. No. <laughs> Tim, at the back. I'm definitely not using TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you were, that'd be great. TikTok. Tim TikTok. <laughs> Love it, Tom. Um, oh, sorry, hang on one minute. Sorry, let's have Tim's point about. Uh, I know people who do. Yeah. Uh, especially in UCL, from, I'm, I'm not sure about my faculty actually, but I've seen TikTok use cases uh, mainly from students, union, and student engagement teams, uh, but less for teaching. Uh, yeah, so student engagement. Um, what what do you miss? I personally, I really miss Twitter. I know it still exists. It's called X. It feels like everyone's gone from it. No one seems to be using it. A few people still are, but it was always my go-to. Like on the way here this morning, it's the first time I'd ever gone on the Elizabeth line today. It's the first time I've been to the Olympic Park. I went to the Olympics, I went to other places, I didn't come here um, back in 2012. And it was like the first thing I wanted to do was like that kind of stream of consciousness. I will tweet it. And sometimes I still think in that in tweets, but I have no one sent it. I sent it to Julie, she's still not back. But I sent her a tweet saying, I'm on the Elizabeth line. I'm going to send you a text on the Elizabeth line. This is all, this is all brand new information for me. So I, I miss it, but also I miss it from that kind of community perspective. I'm working on something. I want to see if someone else has tried it. And so Twitter for me was like the easy place to crowdsource. How, how are you guys feeling? Is it just me? Is it because I've been away for 13 months or was, or I don't know, Dom? It, it's, it felt like it used to be a more benign space than it feels right. now. Yeah. And I still use it occasionally, um, but I'm much less prepared to share my stream of yeah. consciousness. So yeah. I keep it in my head. Yeah. And it feels much more like a, a layer on some of the nastiness of the world yeah. as well now. Yeah. And it's a lot. More, it feels a lot more visceral than it than it used to. It's not just it's something I do for work, and here's where I make friends. It's like. There's another, oh, really? there's like a, oh, there's a whole layer that, that wasn't there before. Um, we've got a few hands up and I'm going to get you all in. So, Geraldine. Um, I really miss it. Um, I'm, I'm still on it, but I'm not active. Yeah. I'm opposed, and I take it off my phone. So yeah. I hardly draw on it now. But I do get emails, so I get notifications and emails, and sometimes that makes me find something. If you've been 
retweeted or no, contacted. No, people that I follow, it will send me notifications. Oh, notes yes, me yes. And even through the emails, I am finding out new stuff okay. and finding new pieces. That's interesting. So yeah. I still find it a really useful source of information. And I had, I thought, a really nice resource there of, like you say, crowdsourcing and, and finding out what was going on, not just in the UK, but outside of your bubble. Yeah. Um, and so I missed that a lot. And don't so, feel like there's been a replacement. And it feels like there's so much crap on it now, that the, the horrible stuff that didn't used to be there, that you can't see the useful stuff. So actually, that's quite a good idea of setting yourself a notification of someone specific that you liked to follow. You can still access those tweets. Are they called tweets? I think they are. Uh, Roger. Yes. Yes. Equally on what I call public, as in anyone can transmit or whatever, um, I'm just observing my picture a bit of them all. Um, they're going much more for private groups, whatever those private groups look like. So, not so much, they seem to be fairly back from agnostic, I mean, it's not showing you know, wherever it is, but a lot of people going to private groups, and even this group organised them just now. <laughs> Very old fashioned technology, but it's a private group. Yes. Um, and I think that's something I'm I'm sort of observing more from the public um, transmission of yes. the stream of consciousness and everything else. Yeah. We know that there'd be much more for private groups, even yes. on things like Facebook and stuff. You know, the only bit I use on Facebook now is private groups, yeah. like community groups, and yeah. so yeah. uh, not the rest of the public. Yeah, either. interesting, um, similar. So I wonder if that's happening with uh, our students as well, if like they're in the so in private spaces, wherever they may be. So the, the public to the private. Elliot. Yeah, just uh, uh, what people were saying in the chat, a few people have missed Twitter. Some people have switched to Masto, Mastodon, um, JD, right? It's interesting. Uses Masto the same way I use Twitter. Mm -hmm. Basically, learning about a lot about that. Um, but fewer replies, of course, because the ecosystem is now so fragmented, which is a pity. But there are a few familiar faces who do uh, pop in occasionally. Um, there's some interesting uh, people checking out TikTok to see what students are saying about AI. Mm -hmm. Um, or the or the universities so kind of just having a dab, dabbing into it and having a view of what's going on. Yeah. Tim. Two things. Uh, a lot of our students use WeChat, which probably is a sort of a lot of our origins. Uh, but on, on the social media stuff for professional purposes, uh, I use Twitter and so on very, very rarely mm. these days. Uh, and I found it very liberating to not do yeah. so. Yes, Twitter mm -hmm. used to uncover information that you would not otherwise come across, but it also, even when it was perceived beneficial, it was a giant time waster. Yes. Time that I did not have for other things. Yeah. And since I've uh, been using it much less, yeah. I found that I actually had more time. And yeah. to me, that is actually a huge relief. So not using social media yeah. and try to draw you in and make you addicted yeah for me it was a positive method oh, that's really yeah and actually similarly a week ago about a week ago i deleted facebook and instagram off my phone because i am aware of thank you thank you <laughs> what a what a time waster i mean i probably go to bed now a lot earlier because i'm not just like scrolling through stupid videos why did i do that i'm like like you know so this is this is a good thing it's as incredible. well Put it, get, I, I have started reading a book. I mean, it took me a while post baby to, to have that brain space. Uh, so Roger and I did have a little chat about this accidentally because we were meeting about something else. And we were talking about the closed networks and the public spaces. So my final thought is, has what some people may not have even considered a golden age, but I certainly did. The golden age of open collaboration and in terms of messaging and getting a response or lots of people telling me to paint my fence green, which is what I did. Has it been replaced by closed networks? That was Roger uh, preempted that. So, like, so, like, WhatsApp groups. You know, I've got a WhatsApp group for my Blee friends. Um, for those of you who are in the Blee network, it's informal. We use it to say, let's all go for a social or something. It's I have to try and get people's phone numbers. We're on it, and um, Anna. Um, so, so I'm doing that. I guess is that. Do you agree with that? Is that your experience? At the back. Um, yeah, I'll say that um, I, I think personally with myself, I've become, become a lot more careful where you know, this kind of thing and probably a little bit more uh, suspicious of how mm. I'm aware of. You know, so I'm probably myself, I would say I have changed. 
Yes. Yeah. I wonder if is this a societal change like post pandemic that we've all become a bit less, you know, I come into London, I'm right, I'm gonna meet Joe, I'm gonna meet all these like people I'll fit in rather than just wandering around Bloomsbury, which is what I did in the old days. Maybe our just our mental way of working and physical is changed. I don't know, Dom, is that a hand or are you just resting your ears? It's a hand. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if, if I think about the sort of Facebook Twitter comparison, I mean, I stopped using Facebook quite a lot earlier. Um, and it was around about the Cambridge Analytica oh, yeah. data yeah. harvesting thing, which I had a, had a suspicion about anyway. It's yeah. like, oh, hang on, the uh, you know, global security apparatus I could be being swept up into some of this. Maybe it just won't share that yeah. picture of my fence yeah. or whatever it might have been in that. Uh, and I, I certainly, I, I was always purposeful not to share pictures of my daughter on there, yeah. even at the disposal first. Twitter, I think maybe it's coincidence, but it, up until the Musk purchase, it was, it still felt <clears throat> open enough. And, um, in between Cambridge Analytica and Musk, Musk it's it, it, it feels very much like it's it's all sort of closed off. Yeah. But then again, I mean, you know, closed network. I mean, you know, Crystal knows. So, you know, I, I also run an internet radio station. As some of you are aware, we communicate entirely on Discord, and there's a public component to that, mm -hmm. but there's also the closed. A, a closed component to that, and it's it's great to have both. Yeah, yeah, you've got the choice, yeah. but you use it carefully. Yeah. Well, I, do, I wouldn't, you know, I don't share stuff that is harvestable. Yeah. Be quite the same. Um, does anyone else want to? Yeah? Yeah, interesting suggestion in the chat. Um, so Leah said maybe we should try and promote uh, Macedon because it's all that the M25 can use. We said we used to use the M25 uh, hashtag on Twitter. Yeah. Link to meetings, but also just to share something people might look at eventually. If if you all here would be up for that, then I maybe I oh, this is a stupid idea. I'll create something. I'll create a Macedon account for a start. And we could give it a go at the next meeting. Obviously, we'd need people on there to try it out. Well, I'll talk to the M25 committee. That's that's you, Elliot, and a few of the others, and then we'll, we'll, we'll maybe have a think about that. Thank you for uh, letting me indulge you into this thing, which is like, where did everyone go? I don't think I've lost you all because you're all here. Was it Chris who was saying, you know, we've got our GISC mail, which is like the professional way of communicating with each other. It kind of feels a shame that I haven't got like my community in my back pocket that I can just send a quick message to. Um, but, you know, things are changing all the time. I think, yeah, that's it. If you want to get in touch with me, there's my email address. It's probably now the best place to, to get hold of me. Don't use Twitter. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs>
To the when I start now. Because I don't want to be rude and disappear halfway through. This is a new edition. You have making your no, 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 no. I'm not the shameless yet. I mean, you can at the end of the day. You can do it at the end of it if you want. I don't have a problem with that. You need a running, a running man. Oh, yes. Hello, everyone. Can I have your attention, please? Thank you. Um, this is not part of the agenda. Is a new item. Um, I'm Puyin. I'm one of the trustees with Alt. And just want to let you know, people online as well, wherever the camera is, this one, isn't it? Uh, we are currently looking to recruit two trustees to start with us some, some, from September this year. Um, you can, um, I can put the link in the chat somewhere. But if you just Google Alt Trustee Recruitment, you can find all the requirements. Um, it will be. Everyone will be subject. Can people be okay? There will be a proper application and recruitment process. It's a light recruitment process. Um, so yeah, just um, spread the word. Um, if you want to have a chat with me about what it's like being a trustee in terms of enjoyment and requirements and obligation, I'm around and the pub, in the pub as well later. Um, but yeah, just to let you know, we are recruiting for two trustees. I'm a retired trustee, but I won't be in the pub, and that's not because <laughs> yeah, um, it is quite a fulfilling role, um, and the, the the time that's required of you is actually minimum, probably average about two three hours a month. Uh, it's a voluntary post; you won't get paid, but you do get a lot of opportunities to do quite high level um, sort of strategic projects. So, for example, I currently lead the uh, EDI action plan that is going to be published or if it hasn't been published and also the CMOT committee as well. So you will get a lot of opportunities to um, take part in various things um, that drive the direction of travel of alt. Um, so yeah, that's the shameless pitch of um, please apply or tell anyone who you think might be interested. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we'll pass over to Tim. I'll just get you to stop. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. You can do. Yeah. 
I brought an old-fashioned tool that says actually turn, turning technologies. Remember that? Clickers? And I'm, I, I just brought it because I think I'm too tall for the camera. <laughs> so let's elevate the camera and see. Is that better? No, that's actually worse. You know, it might be. It might be? Yeah. That's a very wobbly owl. <laughs> yeah, it gets better. Yeah, all right, it adjusts. Perfect. Just want to pull just take down, down, maybe? It seems to adjust. Let me put it on there. Oh, yeah. Let's keep it there, then we can move over. Yeah? Yeah. I, I hope people online can see all that. Uh, yeah, uh, so I, most, I, I know most faces here, but not all. So uh, I don't know if, uh, well, if you don't know me, I'm Tim Neumann. I'm a lecturer at the UCL Knowledge Lab uh, and have been uh, at the Knowledge Lab for almost 20 years. And the Knowledge Lab celebrates its 20th anniversary this year. <laughs> Yay. So look forward to an exhibition um, in at the end of October, which I'm trying to put together with the help of students. And uh, also, we have the um, annual Richard Noss lecture. This year, it will be done by Diana Lorillard. Uh, so that's something to look forward to. You can follow it online. Uh, or in person, um, although we only have 35 spaces. Anyway, that's in October. With me today is Jen, who is an alumna from our MA in Education and Technology. And Jen and I, together with Sophie, who I think is online, um, we have organized an activity that we're here to talk to you about but only in a few minutes, because before I would like to talk to you about something else that we've done. So over the past three months at IOE, my faculty of UCL, Faculty of Education Society, number one in the world, I have to say this, marketing and blah, blah, blah. Um, we ran a number of activities under, well, uh, I'm not under that heading, that is my invention, spot the alliteration if you can. So Academic Alliance, uh, I was at a workshop a few weeks ago where someone clever has said uh, in order to deal with the AI challenge, we have to talk to each other and talk with our students and work together with them to find a proper solution. So that's what we did. We received funding to pay for 150 hours of student work. Uh, in UCL, every faculty got some money, different levels according to size. We got 150 hours of student work and we ran four different projects uh, that are all ending on the 31st of July. Um, I'm talking about project number one and number three, a survey and um, what was labeled hackathon and turned into a challenge. Um, so, sorry, uh, my uh, syllable per minute rate is going to increase because there's quite a lot to talk about. Um, the first project was a survey, which was actually an undergraduate project, project from uh, Yin Tong. And I snuck in six AI related questions. This survey was an assessment and feedback experience survey to find out from IOE students how they experience assessment and feedback and, uh, well, and what their experience and attitudes towards AI in assessment was. So, uh, Two of these six questions were adapted from a happy study. I'll share the slides afterwards. You can link through to the study. Uh, the happy study had 1.2K responses, and we achieved 144 students uh, uh, responses. Sorry, uh, but this is unclean data. We are still analyzing them, <laughs> uh, the data, so 144 will be reduced. This is a work card from the first question. Give us three words how, what, that is, you associate with AI. And unsurprisingly, chat GPT features, robots, uh, smart help, and so on. Now, if you use word clouds to analyze such data, yeah, it's nice and interesting. But uh, I, I would like to show you that you can actually do something that gives you better insight than just looking at these words. Same words, just differently formatted. 
I did a sentiment analysis and all positive words were green, all negative words are red. If you can't distinguish between red and green, sorry, I did this in a rush. Um, yeah, so, but if you can distinguish, then green is dominant, but your eyes are drawing to the red things. And that is really interesting. Uh, so students really do sense the danger of AI um, and they identify AI with potential plagiarism. It's scary, um, it's superficial, it's threatening, but then also stupid. Uh, and somewhere there is, uh, oh, I don't care, an idiot disruptive. <laughs> It, it's quite interesting. It gives you a sense how students actually think about AI. Now, this is one of the heavy questions that I replicated. Which of the following have you used AI for since the beginning of your studies? Uh, the blue bits are IOE results. The black bits are happy results. And you can already see the difference. The happy study was done in February. Ours was done now in, in, in June. So. Our students use AI much, much more than in the HAPPY study. It might just be bad sampling, but it might also indicate a trend that you know, people are using this technology. Uh, it's there and we have to deal with it. Uh, so enhancing and editing writing comes up top, translating comes up second, um, and generating text, that's where it starts to get concerning. Um, comes third, concerning because we all know AI will always hallucinate. It's built into the system. We can't get away from hallucination. And if you understand properly how AI works, then you know it will probably always hallucinate. Uh, so, uh, and it will always have a bias. So, using AI for generating text, well, <laughs> can be okay in some circumstances, but I do have some problems with that. Um, the other question, what do you think is an acceptable use for Gen N AI for assessed work, for preparing an assessment and so on? It's not the exact wording of the question. And uh, there are some happy bars missing because these answers were not in the happy uh, questionnaire. So, and I'm glad that I uh, included the other answers uh, because improved the quality of my writing comes up top together with explain concepts. I have no problems with that, improving the quality of writing. I might have a problem with using AI to explain concepts because of bias and um, hallucination. But anyway, uh, uncontroversial, suggesting ideas, summarizing, yeah, oh, kind of okay. And um, then fewer students are using it to generate a structure and uh, very encouraging um, only one student clicked uh, using AI. Uh, it's okay to use AI to submit generated text without editing. So the students know what's correct and what's not, but whether they then act like it, it's a different question. Um, one question that I want to present, which of the following users of AI do you try to accept for supporting grading and feedback, so for staff use? And this is also quite interesting. Uh, students are happy for the tutor to uh, enhance their feedback or to highlight things that tutors should comment about, but they are totally unhappy for the AI to decide on your grade. Well, that's, uh, you could have guessed that, but it's good to have this uh, as uh, data, actually. And then there are some other categories uh, in the interest of time. Let's move on. So this, these are a few survey results. Uh, the other questions were open text questions. We're still analyzing them and I'll be back at some point or, or we'll publish the results somewhere. Right, let's move on to project three, which is where Sophie and Jen uh, became involved. So we hired Sophie, who is an undergraduate student uh, going into the third year from September. And Jen, you completed when? Uh, technically just this past year. Right, okay, it's a fresh graduate from our MA Education and Technology, but already uh, professionally underway and organizing all sorts of activities uh, yeah, in, in the learning technology field. So remember her name, you might come across her. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, we originally wanted to just run an afternoon of a hackathon, 
on uh, AI and assessment, but when we tossed around ideas, we realized a challenge would make more sense than to give students time, so more time. So we uh, developed six briefs that were to be uh, so groups could choose their brief um, and had nine days to address this brief. Out of the 43 who were interested, we ended up with actually 32, not 30 uh, completed people in eight groups. It ran as hybrid format, so people could participate from wherever they were. Uh, only the people in London got the catering at the final event. And uh, participants from all phases, from undergraduate through to alumni. And uh, yeah, we were only able to perform this because of Sophie and Jen, because Sophie has organized a challenge in her role as the now president, I think, hopefully, um, of the um, Edu, no, uh, uh, EIE Society, a student society about entrepreneurship and innovation. innovation yeah. Education, innovation, and, and innovation. Entrepreneurship. entrepreneurship. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. OK. Sorry, yeah. Sophie. Uh, and Jen has been participating in the challenge uh, from which we actually took all the materials to adapt them in order to move quickly. And this is the point where Jen tells you more about the challenge. Right. So um, as, we, as we've been talking about, um, you know, looking at ChatGPT and looking at the, the release of that in November 2022, uh, um, that obviously stimulated quite a lot of discussion and a lot of challenges for um, not only people in uh, higher education, but also in K-12 schools as well. Um, so assessment being one of the kind of big hot topics where cheating and plagiarism becomes quite the, uh, the, de the debate. Um, we kind of, um, what we wanted to do was we kind of wanted to get, uh, uh, gather the experiences of um, all the students that have gone through IOE uh, assessment practices um, and kind of gather their challenges and perspectives um, to kind of allow a wide representation of perspectives to be kind of um, included in the challenge. And so, yeah, so they, uh, this is kind of like a staff, staff um, student partnership in which we can kind of navigate this kind of very complex uh, mission of assessment reform. Uh, this is a little timeline to show you kind of how it was structured. So 1st of July, we had the challenge kickoff. Um, and again, everything was hybrid. Um, so we were face-to-face, um, -face, but also on Teams as well. This was a, uh, just to kind of set the scene for, um, for the participants and for the team uh, participants to actually meet their teammates and start to actually talk about what brief they wanted to tackle. Um, they had a really quick turnaround in which they had to choose their brief on um, the next day actually at 12 p.m. Um, and then we, and then throughout the week, we actually just kind of gave them uh, expert slash support sessions from different professors that were part of the knowledge lab um, that are very much involved in digital education or AI and assessment. Um, then we had the final presentations um, on the 9th of July. So it was, it was quite a very, very rushed, um, there was a lot to fit in in those nine days. Uh, what we did to kind of incentivize the groups to actually participate, even though we had a little bit of funding, um, which we actually decided to spend splurge on catering. Um, but actually, we thought it would be better to incentivize uh, the already kind of motivated students that um, are really interested in this space already. So we thought um, with the new student journal that has actually just been uh, released a couple weeks ago, um, we were allowing them to actually publish their findings um, in that journal, um, especially for those uh, master's students that are looking for PhD opportunities. That would be a really good um, opportunity for them. And then also uh, actually having the, the chance to have their solutions or the suggestions being implemented at the IOE and seeing that the um, the change, I guess, and the impact that they were um, having. Uh, what did they need to do? So they needed to uh, produce a five minute presentation um, alongside a summary report. However, the summary report was actually not graded. This was more just a little opportunity for the 
participants to actually um, just explain in more detail about their solutions because we realized that five minutes is quite uh, quite a compact limited um, amount of time. Uh, then we had a, them presenting their findings to panel judges, which were um, which actually Tim's going to talk about as well. Essentially, they were six, uh, senior staff members at the IOE as well as um, the UCL level as uh, UCL level to allow um, the solutions to be heard at both levels as well. And then the panel of judges, uh, we've got six here that Tim's just going to talk about. Yeah, um, these are really senior people. Pro director education in our faculty, you can't get hired. This is the person who's responsible for all teaching and learning at IME. Uh, Steve Broward is from UCL, and he was here earlier this morning in the Muggle session. He did a tour of the UCL East Campus. He uh, took part head of digital education future, so he represented UCL. Two. Uh, people who are uh, so-called academic heads of learning and teaching from two of our two different departments of our faculty. So they are responsible for that departmental teaching and learning. Um, Professor Manolis Medriquez from the Knowledge Lab represented AI and analytics in education. And Professor Mary Richardson from IOE, um, she is an expert in education assessment. And they are pretty well-known people. They are pretty high up in terms of seniority. So students were a bit some students were a bit nervous to present to such a panel, but also are quite excited to get the opportunity. And keep in mind, we did not just run this exercise for fun. We really wanted something out of it. What would students and alumni come up with? Just quickly, uh, how did we communicate uh, teams? Uh, two alumni didn't get access to their alumni account for some reason, so we were still able to onboard them. But we gave Teams a shop front uh, using SharePoint. Teams is just SharePoint with a different view. So uh, this, I think, made things a bit user friendly, and we were using all the Microsoft tools, PowerPoint lists, and Stream, and whatnot. And that worked, I think that worked quite well. Yeah, okay, it worked well. I'm looking uh, over there because I'm going to embarrass Christina now. Christina was taking part in the challenge, even though she's a UCL staff member, but she's also an alumna of the MA in Education and Technology. Uh, so kind of an advantage in that group as well. Uh, that group didn't win, didn't win though. <laughs> um, we're so close to winning. Yeah, yeah, you were very close indeed. Um, so what, what were the briefs? First one, the big one, academic integrity, how do we ensure authorship of submissions? Uh, the second one, how do we build AI literacy for students? The third one, it's called ethical automation, but it's really about what is good teaching and learning with AI and how can we move on from thinking about good and bad categories when we think about AI? Because it's neither purely good or purely bad. The fourth one is AI augmented feedback acceptable. We saw something of it in the survey. The fifth one is math specific, and the sixth one wasn't done by anybody, so we can forget about that. That is an internal thing <laughs> that we wanted to improve as well. Um, nobody identified their own problems, and uh, AI literacy was the most popular. So every brief came with problem statements, some suggested resources, and success criteria and then students were given the scoring criteria uh, for uh, that the panel was working with. Um, and here are screenshots from the out outputs uh, from the eight different groups. And what the groups produced, honestly, we weren't prepared for that. The quality was so good. A complete AI literacy curriculum, including an implementation plan, how to roll it out over six to nine months a framework for multi-level AI literacy program. Um, the, the, this is about the augmented feedback. What does it take to move to a true hybrid feedback model? A full questionnaire mandatory for students to assess academic literacy. A full assessment program to ensure authorship. What forms of assessment should be there in the module? 
thinking through the problems of using AI and the opportunities with examples of which tools could be used. An experiment comparing augmented feedback with other feedback. Uh, and of, uh, some uh, pedagogical strategies to address the teaching of maths with the help of AI. Seriously, that was top quality. And it will take us weeks, if not months, to go through this and take recommendations out of it. But that's what we are going to do. So, uh, appropriately, the feedback from judges was super positive. You can read it for themselves, but the judges are still contacting me, uh, or when I run into them, they emphasize what a great experience it was. And participants seemed to like it as well. Uh, students came up to me afterwards uh, to say, oh, thanks for the opportunity. Well, it was great. But obviously, we also had some people who uh, were dropping out. So uh, it might have been a bit much for them. But judging by the amount of work that students have produced, they really worked hard. Uh, so the challenges were to manage these hybrid groups across the globe uh, in a compressed time frame. So uh, we were trying, to, we, we actually had to mix London-based and non-London-based people together. And our initial proposed deadlines to do something by the next day didn't work. So um, next time that is our learning, we would have to uh, do this if, if that ever is the next time. But anyway, um, the, on the positive side, as I mentioned, the quality exceeded expectations by a large margin. Um, people all seem to appreciate the work, so we were able to manage a win-win-win situation. We got something out of it, the student got something out of it, they had some mostly intrinsic rewards, um, and yeah, everyone had fun and produced good quality. So I have to say, in, I've only been in higher education for just under 20 years, but this has to rank as one of the best student engagement activities of my career so far. Uh, it is really remarkable. So do it yourself. Please do it. Please do such an exercise. Uh, the students you have, they are uh, really, um, oops, sorry, uh, they are really a valuable resource that should not remain untapped. I thought I had another slide. Ah, yeah, but I updated it apparently after the um, after this tab was opened. Anyway, um, does that not uh, get in the way of the sharing? Uh, Ah, there. Yeah, so the only non-intrinsic reward, we gave all students a badge in Moodle, so they have it in their Moodle profile, <laughs> and uh, they could pick up a certificate, and we used Moodle for that. Uh, so we have a, the custom certificate plugin in our platform. It's super easy, no administrative effort uh, for me. Just enroll them onto a Moodle course, they go there, they have their certificate with a serial number, which can be validated externally. And then secondly, the open badge uh, uh, even has an endorsement from the Knowledge Lab, so you can put it on your LinkedIn profile and uh, have all the uh, credentials alongside it. And actually, there's quite a few um, people that did upload the certificate as well on LinkedIn, and there's been quite a lot of engagement with that as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't really that. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah, so I have one more thing, if you allow me, uh, for... for one or two minutes. Uh, this is a completely different activity, but it falls also another banner of academic alliance. Uh, and this is work that I've done earlier in the year on um, uh, guidelines for AI in dissertations. So uh, this was commissioned work by um, my faculty, and uh, the output is to have five quick sheets. Um, uh, which you can download from here if you want, um, to help with student staff communication in dissertation supervision sessions. Uh, that can be undergraduate, postgraduate, or doctoral uh, thesis supervision sessions. So uh, it's, it's really 
each sheet is one page and uh, takes you through what are the risk areas of using AI, um, how are the risks, how can you assess the risks by dissertation phase, because you know, the literature review phase has fewer risks than the writing up phase. Writing up phase has a lot of academic integrity risks, but when you search for literature, where there is, uh, where is there an academic integrity problem? There is not. So um, think through what you're doing and identify the relevant risk, and you will be better able to uh, decide whether use of AI is appropriate or not. And then some positive use cases to inspire, some uh, discussion questions for your supervisor, and uh, finally also ethical issues but that needs some further work so i'm just jumping through that because i should really stop talking um there's a link to the slides uh and that's it if you want to hear first-hand experiences from the challenge then ask christina over there <laughs> yeah uh, if you have any questions then uh we're here thank you It might be, although we, when you look at the students we involved, uh, the I, you know, you, you might have a wrong image of the IV. Uh, it's <laughs> not just that there are uh, all super education experts. No, we, we have this departments like the Social Research Institute who have nothing to do with teaching and nothing to do with assessment. Uh, that they are looking at uh, how education systems evolve in societies and so on, or not even uh, well, uh, the Center for Longitudinal Studies. Uh, they are running uh, these birth cohorts where they're following people who were born in a particular year, in a particular week, from life, to, from birth to death. And that has nothing to do with education. And we had like three or four students from uh, these areas as well. Um, so I, um, yes, there was obviously a number of students who had sort of, who were bringing experience with them and therefore you could expect those people to perform well and being really interested, but not across the board. What I would say though is probably, um, because of our spending, we might attract pretty good students and motivated students overall, which might not always be the case. But I don't want to dismiss other institution students because uh, <laughs> having had uh, this experience, I think students are generally pretty interested in working with staff, given the opportunity. So our job is to create these opportunities. I think another issue. Oh, sorry. Did you have to train or teach students, the students about AI, like how it works, its limitations, and what it's good at? Good question. Um, that's why we had, um, the, well, first of all, um, the short answer is no. In nine days, we didn't really have the time for that. But each brief contained a list of resources which were uh, some of these resource, resources were quick primers of what uh, AI in the particular context of the brief means. And then we had these three expert sessions where uh, staff, uh, three different staff, proper experts, um, really high level experts. Wayne Holmes uh, just made professor, uh, he is part of the expert group and of the Council of Europe who developed the legal framework that the Council of Europe released, uh, which is, has been then used by the EU to develop their legal AI legislation stuff. So, you know, proper experts. Um, and uh, these were opportunities then for students to clarify questions, but also to hear exactly uh, how to think about AI and these issues. And that was enough. 
Uh, having said that, uh, we had like, uh, I think about six or seven students, about 32 from uh, the education and technology uh, circles, and they were bringing with them the previous on this prior understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, no question. Right. So, All right. So we told me she can't speak, so. <laughs> Yeah, Christina. Um, mine is more a question, but it's more like um, a little bit about the experience. And it was wonderful to be part of it. It was super structured. So we had like an instant session, and they gave us lots of prompts to think about. They also provided with provided us with research papers to look at, and also like with a rubric and specific things that we kind of guide down. Because like nine days is a lot for you to come up with a whole project and go from the design of it to the implementation. Um, we, particularly as a group, had a little bit of like a difficulty because some people were like on the other side of the world, the community was super hard, and then they kind of dropped out. Um, but that being said, that also helped us to get closer and to approach the project in a different way. So we had to do a little bit of problem solving as well. And we also had a lot of support because we had a check-in session. We were asked if we need anything. We managed to figure everything out. Um, they were updating us daily with. Um, the sessions and then also with like what's going on, the track of like the timelines and everything. And then again, I was amazed at the actual product of the presentations from everybody else that participated. Like I would have not expected that in nine days they would have produced something like that. So if you don't have a chance, uh, I would definitely recommend to talk to the team about trying something like that out. Um, as being part of it, I realized my interest in the field and I kind of want to see how I can explore it even more now. And actually, um, just to add to that, uh, as Tim said, we did borrow a lot of the stuff, the structure from um, the UCL Careers uh, event where they had the IOE employee, uh, Employers Challenge. And I actually took part in that uh, a few months ago, and we structured it quite like so. I, I just want to give a little bit of credit to, to John Bramey because uh, he not only did provide us with um, the resources, but also when I took part in that challenge as well, we found the outcome was honestly just as brilliant as what I like we saw this time around. And um, I think around the same amount of people participated. And uh, yeah, it was like as a, as a as a as a student, we I, I would say that I was always looking for um, opportunities to actually collaborate with staff and have that kind of like one to one time to ask questions and do something kind of a little bit more like extra to your to your learning because I think for a lot of people in course graduate they're not just there for just the education part right they're they're actually looking to network and they're looking to make more um, learning but either way I uh, yeah I just wanted to say I thought it was brilliant <laughs> Yeah, um, sounds like you had a really successful student engagement initiative here. This is very well structured and thought through uh, and delivered. Um, how much of it was driven by AI being the tech du jour? And could it apply as a model for uh, high student engagement initiatives with other non-AI related topics? Yes, to the letter. Um, it could, uh, we, we have the proof that it works for other areas. Jen, you've just talked about the employment challenge. And Sophie, I don't know uh, if, if, if she wants to say something, if she can speak, uh, because of uh, 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 this morning she uh, texted that her voice is gone. Uh, but Sophie has organized a challenge, uh, a curriculum challenge, uh, to my knowledge, had nothing to do with AI. And they also had some really high student engagement where they were using the ABC workshops uh, that many of you probably know. Uh, and they ended up with uh, a lot of learning designs. Uh, I forgot the topic now, but maybe Sophie can type uh, into the text chat what uh, that challenge at the start of the year was about. And, and all of these challenges, these three just together, have seen high student engagement. So it's not just restricted to our AI, I would say. 
I think it's more about the relevancy and the applicability of those skills and in, in real world context. And um, so like, for example, the employers challenge, what motivated me was, I mean, what they tried to do was simulate the world of work in which you have to collaborate on a, on a team project and in a very kind of limited time, um, limited time frame and have to essentially come up with a business proposal, right? And essentially it's kind of simulating that workplace environment. And we were able to kind of like put that on the CV and LinkedIn, that kind of stuff. So I think, and again, I think we had the advantage of, you know, AI being the hot topic, but again, I would say the engagement with the employers challenge was just as much as this one. Um, and that was more driven by people actually just wanting to engage in extra learning opportunities and being able to actually put their skills to practical use, I guess. Maybe one more comment um, on, on the, the sort of reward uh, thing, uh, because with another organization, I'm an uh, organization rep on the National Council for Volunteer Organizations, which uh, sort of uh, yeah, uh, propagates the role of volunteers and that there should be appropriate recognition. So uh, I'm very minded that the balance of uh, effort to reward should be a positive one. And we didn't really offer any practical incentives. I mean, you can't call UCL catering a <laughs> very good incentive. Uh, and uh, I mean, the, the winner got 25 pounds. Hooray. Uh, nothing to shout home about. But uh, th there were quite a lot of intrinsic motivations. You know, certificate and badge, all nice. Uh, and, and documenting, yeah, that you help hold something in your hand. But I think it was the intrinsic motivations uh, the um, op the the well opportunity to talk to present this to senior staff and to have the option that your work actually makes a difference to teaching and learning in an institution that is a huge driver I think and we, we, we already have started implementing some of these uh, recommendations from the challenge uh, in our place so and, and more will come. Oh, and also for the employers channel, which he actually got specific employers to make the briefs themselves. And they actually based those briefs on the real challenges that they were working on in the workplace. So not only did they actually set the briefs, but they came and judged and gave us the one to one with uh, the employer themselves. And these employers were actually quite relevant as well. So I worked with the, the Islington Council. There was one that was quite a, a big like mentoring like company, but yeah, but I think that that relevancy of is, is the key. Yeah, real world applications. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so Sarah's actually in the chat. You said yeah, uh, it was a curriculum design challenge where students and teams were tasked to help enhance new modules and create new programs. That's really good. And very practical. We do have maybe five more minutes to give a quick question. I was going to ask what. Well, sorry. So, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, just response. a question. So, don't you, don't you think that the success of the project was kind of driven, maybe not fully, but partially by the, all this preparatory work which was done by the team? So, for example, you and um, uh, other members of the team. So, because it's not like, you know, the project it took place within just eight or nine days. But how much work was done before the project even started, you know? So that that was <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty chaotic yeah. three weeks before or so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you kind of try to if we, for example, we decide to do something similar, we need to be kind of realistic, you know. Yeah. So whether we'll be able to achieve this or not, you know, because how many people will be involved in that? And so planning, planning is meant to be key here as well. But, Actually, I think maybe the f initial session might be quite hefty, but after you've kind of gone through it, I think if we were to actually run this again, it would be more or less straightforward. And um, I think that the key is just getting the buy-in from the professors, because um, I think that was a big motivator for the students as well. Um, I don't know if you want to. Yeah. yeah, well, nothing to add. <laughs> I was just on the timing, because if it's nine days, where can you fit that into the academic year? When can you do it after it's done? 1st to 9th July, so really earlier this month. Yeah. 
uh, uh, freshly completed. That's, yeah, the timing wasn't ideal anyway, but no timing is ever ideal. Uh, but the good thing is students by this time should have ended their teaching phase on their exams. The bad thing is uh, the students from outside of London uh, might be elsewhere in the world, which adds to the challenge, or they might be on holiday in that whole time. Yeah, think through when you do it. There will never be an ideal time. And our timeline, we wanted to run it a little bit earlier, but things get delayed. And also, I think like the nine days is pretty, pretty arbitrary, right? Because the employees challenge, I think, actually only went for five days. Um, and I would honestly be, it, it really, I guess, depends on the deep level of detail and the net level of what kind of meaningful outcome that you want, because I, for someone to tackle something as big as academic integrity within a day is a bit much to ask. Um, but it, I guess it kind of depends on the context, but it is quite flexible. Um, it's not, you have to do nine, 10 days. Awesome. We can thank uh, Jen and Sam and Sophia. We're almost at the end of the M25 Muggle Marathon. <laughs> uh, been with us since the start of the day. So we just have one more activity, uh, which is just a bit of fun, really. Um, so, yeah, I think we've covered kind of looking back you know, with the uh, icebreaker, with uh, projects that have happened, whether it's Pat um, or Sarah's kind of thoughts about social media or the presentation that we've just seen now. Uh, so we wanted to kind of finish on something maybe looking a bit more uh, forward uh, and also something maybe, you know, people can talk about after today and maybe at the pub if they're, following, if they're coming along. Um, do you want to intro and I'll get yeah. the cards with you? Okay, so some of you might have already come across uh, what the idea of respective futures and scenarios. I know Dom's done something at previous M25 um, and at some other events. A colleague, Sam, in um, UCL did something um, where she got people to do this kind of activity. We're going to use um, some scenarios that have been created by the University of Edinburgh. Some people might have come across them. Um, they're speculative futures. So, um, some of them are quite maybe out there, um, but we we want you to sort of think about them in terms of um, levels of granularity. So no, maybe not the whole story will come true, but maybe parts of it will. And not thinking about the, the scenarios and what, what elements may be already starting to happen. Um, but they're designed to be a starting point for conversations. Uh, and um, the idea is that, that you have these discussions based on the scenarios that you get. So we've got um, different scenarios. The idea is that then you'll have a read, think about how likely is this scenario to happen, um, what elements might already be happening, um, and how it might impact you and your institution, and how you might want to prepare for that. And um, we've got Padlet that we've got QR code, I can put the link in the chat as well, uh, to, to add comments onto. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a chance to think, like we said, we've done the past thing, what we learned, now the idea is thinking forward, what might we be coming up against, what, what might we need to prepare for, um, and, and what, what situations might be on the horizon or already starting to impact us. Um, so Elliot's going to give out some scenarios, and you can move around if there's people have left, I can see one person maybe want to join some, another table. Uh, and online, we were thinking, you know, as... Uh, earlier, we'll share the link to the scenarios and you can pick some and maybe you can chat amongst themselves, we can, we can turn off the mic so you guys can have a talk um, and you can add things to the Padlet. So please do join in online. Um, I'll get some links going. Oh, Elliot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we do quick a couple of minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so to touch on the discussion, hopefully it can continue. Um, so these are the different scenarios. Uh, definitely recommend, we'll obviously share the slides, reading them online. If you just had your cards today, but they have an accompanying uh, short story for each scenario, which I really recommend um, to bring it home. Uh, we wondered if people wanted to share, like any thoughts from in their table. Um, we have about five five minutes or so. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to start? Christina, uh, I think I'm somewhere. No, 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 over here. In oh, over here. Um, I'm just going to cover some of the things we talked about because we actually approached it from so many different perspectives. Um, so our scenario is that AI takes over and the landscape of university is kind of completely changes and that you don't do any grading anymore, uh, you don't write essays anymore, that behavioral neuro data, a lot of surveillance is uh, used for the student engagement, for student support and all of that. Um, however, we do have a question of privacy rights. Um, so the whole landscape changes, the academic view. And um, we, we were talking about how we don't think that's possible, but it also depends on the time frame that we can think about. So what's the time scale which we're talking about? We don't think that's going to happen in the next 10 to maybe 50 years, or maybe some aspects of it might be implemented, but not this entirety. And um, then we talked about ethics and data privacy a little bit, because it's one thing to talk about using AI to do assessment and do grading and um, but we don't think the AI can do the content as well, because the AI is a language model. So we kind of train it, it trains on the own, but it has templates, but we don't think it's at the level where it actually do the whole content thing by itself. Because um, it needs content to function. But obviously, we do have that fun technology coming up. We have no idea how that's going to shift things, particularly in terms of AI, but we can't really predict the full field yet. Um, we talked about so many different things. Yeah, no, it's a good mix of things. Does everyone want to chime off that? Like, you talk about time scale. Does everyone have those few positive things there, I think, but some challenges there. Does anyone? Uh, does anybody yeah. have Look at the middle table. We, uh, we have three. Yeah. And it's like the universal university, so it's like everybody attends online, and only research happens in the university premises and administration, which <laughs> so we don't, we're not sure about it, but they can also be used for community engagement. And I think that probably the negative bit was that we will miss the social element, or whoever is in that utopia will <laughs> miss the social element. And uh, also um, that it's not going to be very transferable to some subject areas like the medical sciences and biosciences and surgeons. <laughs> they will struggle when they actually have to go into their job. Yeah. Yeah. I think like the effects, in short term, flexibility of having a wholly online experience is quite, um, you know, it seems like the idea of that, but in the long term, we will be sort of discussing the, the implications. Psychology of people, if you're, you don't have that, it's not just an education, but in all aspects of life, it's that idea of no space, kind of losing it. So, like, if you're only ever like going to work or in your home and you don't have that other space, I think society is going to, you know, is going to suffer for that and to be contributing to that um, when not having a campus is just coming to you necessarily. So, yeah, interesting. You know, on the one hand, it seems like, yeah, it's ideal, everyone gets into university. Hmm. Yeah, super interesting. Um, does anyone else or any other table maybe like uh, share or give you thoughts? What can we do? I mean, quite difficult challenges. So haven't come up with a solution. That's okay. <coughs> anyone else? Front table? 
So we were looking at um, extra minimum bundle and control and micro credentials. Um, we said, we, we do think it's likely that that will happen in some form, um, particularly kind of on the more corporate advice, so one of the examples is on Microsoft Google, drops some notifications around um, and their specific products. Um, but we also said that universities are likely to continue to still exist in their that's the central role of the education because they do offer something outside of the world to the package. Also, there's kind of peer to peer language, you don't necessarily get the kind of market potentials, and also there's kind of like a um, social side that people find valuable. Obviously, that's part of the very university. And there's also kind of like a lot of frameworks for the recognition of market potentials and might at least the short term is quite limited factor on the kind of sectors that it might play to. So something like counseling might work quite well because a lot of play encourage it quite well. But obviously like the law for instance with digital practicing within a government legal framework, then we have to get more chance to have some kind of like the bottom in which you're Okay. okay. I like initially the positive elements that universities will continue to play very important <laughs> role. That might be a good thing to end on. <laughs> So um, yeah, thanks everyone for participating in this. Um, yeah, so I think we have a optional social people uh, yes. sticking around. Yeah, I think we lost the online the yeah. online participants. They ran away, but we did get some <laughs> we did get some uh, um, things on the Padlet, so maybe they contributed in that way. Hopefully, um, but for those who are in the room, um, if you are um, wanting to carry on discussions or just not even these discussions, any discussions. We're going to go to um, just next door. Uh, there is a pub, and oh, I've forgotten the name of it. Where has it gone? Riverside East. Riverside East, that's it. So it's, it's literally you come out the building and it's on the left. Um, so that's where we were going to go. And um, just to uh, give you a heads up about the next meeting. Um, we're going to be doing a bit like Muggle, one in the uh, autumn term. We don't have a date yet. Um, we tend to do online for the autumn term. Um, Very personal. Oh, is it? Oh, in person, yeah. sorry. Oh, well, in that case, maybe we'll we'll team up again with Muggle, but we haven't we haven't set date yet. Um, and the alt conference, some of you may be going to in September. Um, but also just to highlight that uh, alt would like members to come to these events. So if you're not an ALT member, please make sure that you sign up. Hopefully everyone's institution is um, signed up to ALT. So just make sure that you register with ALT because they're going to start putting restrictions on registration um, and ticketing for ALT members only. So we'll send out uh, emails, but um, they're, they're getting uh, stricter about the, the group. <laughs> if your institution is a member, you can become a free associate member. And if you've got CMOG, then you're a member as well. Yeah. So anything else to add about the conference or anything else, Judy? Or uh, Just to say a big thank you to um, all our presenters and to Elliot and Jason and Geraldine who hosted today. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>